June 2005, John and Jean Silverwood and their four children are leaving French Polynesia aboard their 55-foot catamaran, the Emerald Jane. It's the last leg of an incredible year-long voyage from New York to Australia. Family plan was to put the children on the boat for a year and go as far as we could within that year. I was ecstatic. I was very, very happy. It was a big dream of mine. I was the happiest guy in the family. 16-year-old Ben and 14-year-old Amelia are helping out with the younger kids, Jack and Camille, also enjoying the adventure. June 25th is another perfect evening in the South Pacific. Can I watch movie? Sure. They're two weeks away from the end of their journey in Australia as they settle in for the night. <laughs> Everyone is down below, except Ben, who is at the helm on night watch. I couldn't see anything. I could hear waves breaking, and normally that's not too uncommon. But then I started hearing a more constant, like they were breaking on something. The waves are breaking on an uncharted reef, and the boat is heading straight for it. When Ben finally sees it, he doesn't have enough time to change course. There's no way we can slow down and stop enough in time. The boat just started shaking from there. It was just crazy. I remember looking at my dad and just seeing that look on his face really scared me. Good. Dad, what was that? Guys, hold tight. I'm going to get the sat phone. Go with you. Jack, come on. Ben, what happened? I bound up the stairs, and I jump out into the cockpit. And right away, by the lights of the ship, I can see the red fingers of coral beneath us. And I know that we are in a world of trouble. <laughs> Gotta go to the bow now. The Emerald Jane is stuck on a coral reef. As water enters the damaged hulls, waves are also pounding the crippled boat. We're just getting bombarded with wave after wave after wave. Amelia radios for help, Hello? while John activates the emergency beacon. Mayday! Hello? Can anyone hear us? Kids, let's go topside. Come on. The kids perch on the stern of the boat, while John and Ben go to the bow to grab the life raft. And then... John and Jean Silverwood are sailing in the South Pacific with their children when disaster strikes. Their boat hits a reef and begins to break apart. As John scrambles to save his family before the boat sinks, the main mast topples over. moment, I could see the mast of our boat. 80 feet worth of mast is across my knees. And in that same moment, this just electric jolt of pain has come from my leg and explodes in my brain. The next thing I know, there's Ben's face. And he's got bloods coming down either side of his face. He'd been hit in the head by the mast. The mast, the mast fell. Ben's head injury isn't bad, but they can see that the mast has gored John's left leg. I could see just the two bones of my left leg. They, they were cut off. They were shattered. Get this off. And beneath the white of the bones, there's just this spreading pool of blood. Having heard the crash, Gene rushes forward to see what's happened. Ben just said to me, Mom, you don't, you don't want to see it. My mom ignored me, and she started to freak out. John! I just went into complete shock. It was like my whole body shut down. It just shut down. Jean was in a, a world all of her own. She was completely disoriented. I'll be, I'll be right back. Ben immediately goes into action. First thing I knew I needed to do was to stop the bleeding. From Boy Scouts, Ben knows his only option is a tourniquet. Ben, uh, ben I got to put a tourniquet uh, on, OK? Yeah. I got to stop the bleeding. <laughs> 
So I came back with a couple screwdrivers and I tied the rope around his leg. But Ben also knows the risks of applying a tourniquet that may have to stay on for many hours. That person's probably gonna lose the limb. I gotta make it tighter, right? <laughs> I knew just the amount of blood that was coming out, I knew that he would die otherwise. There was no other way. I was pretty sure he was willing to lose his leg over dying. It was a brilliant decision. And if he hadn't done that, I'd have died on the spot. Ben, ben, okay. you're in charge of this boat. I tell him, you've got to be in control of the boat. You've got to take care of the family. Mom, now look at me, OK? We got to keep this tight. We got to get this off, Dad, right now. Help me. When I came out of that state that I was in, I thought, we're going to get him off this boat. We're going to get this mast off of him. We're going to do whatever it takes to survive. Right. Are you ready? Ready? One, two, three. Let's go again. Let's go again. Ready? One, two, Ben is a 16-year-old boy who became a man in seconds. Ready? Come on. Come on. Push when I see lift, OK? Ready? But the mast weighs 3,000 pounds. They can't make it budge. Ready? And to make matters worse, the pummeling waves are continuing to tear the bottom of the boat apart. The hulls are flooded. Time is running out. At one point, I said to Ben, I said, look it, I'm going to lay down on the deck. I'm going to put my feet up on the mast. Right, I know it's a long shot, but let's do it. And as we did that, another one of these massive waves comes. Yes. <laughs> The force of the wave shifts the boat, allowing them to finally move the mast off of John's leg. My leg came out from underneath. Ben and Jean drag John to the stern of the boat to join the other kids. It was a boost to my morale that now he's he, we can actually move him around. I can retie the tourniquet and make it better. And if the boat does sink, it's not going to take him with it. He was being really quiet. It was weird because he wasn't, you know, saying, can you guys do this for me? But he just kept comforting us and telling us everything was going to be OK. But everything is not OK. They know the boat won't stay afloat much longer. Ben sees only one option, the reef. Well, I saw a piece of reef that was still hadn't gone under the water the whole night. So I knew that that was probably a much safer place to go to than being left on the boat. The move is dicey because of the waves. The younger kids are safe, but getting his dad will be much tougher. And I'm laying there, and I think this is my final resting place. I was doing everything and everything I can to save my dad. The life raft is their only hope. Against the odds, they all make it to the reef. We get them to this little tide pool right in front of the ledge that we're hanging out on. So we're safe. We're all off the boat. By the next morning, their boat has completely broken apart and sunk. They are now stranded on a small reef with John barely clinging to life. I completely understood in an instinctive way that to stay alive, I needed to stay away. John, hang on a little bit longer. John and Jean Silverwood wanted to take their children on the ultimate adventure of sailing around the world. Instead, they are in a desperate struggle after their boat hits a reef in the South Pacific. The main mast falls, crushing John's leg, but the family manages to get off the boat before it sinks. Now, they are trapped on a reef in the middle of the ocean as John fights to stay alive. John, hang on a little bit longer. It seemed like the most luxurious thing in the world to let go. But I couldn't. I never, I never considered it. 
In the early morning, Ben notices what looks like a moving star on the horizon. When it keeps moving, he realizes it's a plane. Ben is ecstatic. He's jumping up and down. He's yelling, Dad, Dad, they're coming, Dad. The jet's coming. Dad, over here! That was when Ben shot off the flare. And that was like a strike of hope. Dad! It was like, Dad, it's going to be OK. Look, they're here. Hello? You could tell that they had seen it. And we were, oh gosh, we were just so elated. The jet circles and drops some flares, then goes away. Wait, 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 wait. I knew there was no way a plane could land there, but we were wondering, where's the follow-up? Where's the helicopter or where's the boat? Because my dad needed help now, not, not in a few hours. I'll come back. I'll come back. Fortunately, there's an island nearby inhabited by a Polynesian family. The pilot contacts them, and they immediately head to the reef in their fishing boat. It's a boat! Help! It came in a really beat up dinghy. Help! Help! Dad, his leg's up! It's broken! It's... And so I was trying to communicate to my, them that my dad was in serious trouble, and that we had to get him going now. It takes an hour to get back to the island, but they don't have any medical supplies. They tell Ben and Jean that a rescue helicopter is on the way. That was when I think it started to really hit me that that's my dad over there, and look at how pale he is. That's what people look like when they die. I'm just thinking about what's going to happen to John, what's going to happen to John. You know, is he going to make it? I knew I just had to conserve. I had to remember I wanted to hear my heart beat. And I wanted to hear the air go in my lungs. Just breathe, honey. I was completely consumed with those two jobs. Wake that. Stay awake. Okay. Breathe deep. Breathe deep. The helicopter's here. I cried. I knew help was coming. I knew there was going to be a doctor. The medics worked to stabilize John. And miraculously, he survives the two-hour trip to the hospital in Tahiti. The doctors can't save his leg, but they save his life. I accepted the loss of the leg when I was underneath the mast. I accepted my own death when I was underneath the mast. It's such a miracle to be alive. It was definitely John's will to survive. There's no reason he should be here with the amount of blood he lost and, and the trauma he went through for how many hours. And I mean, he shouldn't be here. Reflecting on their life-changing adventure, Jean makes a decision during John's long recovery. When John was in the hospital, one thing that actually got me to sleep at night was to start writing about everything that happened. And when I got home, we decided, John and I collaborated and put it into a book. The book is cathartic, helping the entire family come to grips with their close brush with death. I'm really happy the way it all worked out and that we, we're all still here. To have experienced what I did as a father, you know, to be able to take to my grave the courage of my children, there's many men that never get to see that side of their kids, and it's, it's what you value in life.